Good evening, my name is Jordan Stratford, and I'm the author of a tween girl mystery STEM series uh, called Wollstonecraft, named after Mary Wollstonecraft, who's the world's first feminist writer in English. And of course, the name of Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, who is uh, considered to be the world's first science fiction author. And in my series, I, have, I, I pair Mary with uh, a young Ada Byron, who's often considered to be the world's first computer programmer. So I have them at 1826, at the ages of 11 and 14, and they open a detective agency, and they, by using STEM skills, fight crimes from 19th century literature. And that's with Knopf, Penguin Random House. Lovely. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ian MacDonald. I am a science fiction writer from just outside Belfast in Northern Ireland. Here is my lovely book. Luna and New Moon, just out from tour two weeks ago. Um, already being adapted for television by CBS TV. Um, hopefully heading for your screens next year-ish sometime. Uh, I can give you three different pictures depending on your age. If you're my age, it's Dallas on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> if you're younger, it's Game of Thrones on the moon. <laughs> If you're classy, it's the godfather on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> but it triangulates between those three. Uh, the point being on the moon, once you're there, you can't get off again. <laughs> so the moon is like this earth orbiting roach motel. Oh. Like once you get in, you can't, never mind. All right. You only get that if you're my age. Uh, I am Barry Liga. I'm the author of a nearly obscene number of books over the last few years, I now realize. But the one that is most relevant to us today is my newest, After the Red Rain, which I wrote in collaboration with Peter Facinelli, who you probably know better as Carlisle Cullen. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the, the basic story is it's several hundred years in the future, and things are so bad that nobody can remember when they were ever good. The environment has completely collapsed. There are 50 billion people living on the planet. So we've basically paved the entire planet so that people can live on it. And uh, everybody's just marking time until the world ends because there's nothing else to do. And then this, this guy shows up, a, a, a boy named Rose, strangely enough. And uh, perhaps he holds the key to saving the world. Oh, well, I'm A.G. Riddle. And uh, this is my novel, Departure. It's a sci-fi thriller about a flight that takes off in 2015 and crash lands in the future. And it's a little like Lost, uh, you know, the, this group of strangers that are thrown in this situation in which they have to figure out, you know, how their plane got in the future, or how to get home. And they each kind of hold a piece to this puzzle. And uh, so it's kind of an adventure and kind of a code-based thriller. And um, David is my editor. They were nice enough to acquire it at Harper Voyager, and it is out in 11 days. Yes, the 20th. Yep. Sorry. On sale early. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mindy McGinnis. I wrote Not a Drop to Drink and In a Handful of Dust, which are both post-apocalyptic survival in a world with very little fresh water to drink. Uh, the basic idea is that there are, it's an overpopulation. We have too many people, not enough water that's actually valuable, drinkable water. And uh, people behave in a situation where your own life is more, uh, is when all life is at risk because of the lack of water, people behave very badly. And that is where my book is set. I have a new book, which is actually a gothic historical thriller, which involves a lot of medical science, specifically lobotomies. Uh, that came out on Tuesday. That is a madness so discreet. Great. So I'm going to be winging this. Um, but obviously all of your books uh, deal with science in some way or the other, uh, whether it's historical, whether it is science of the future. Um, how accurate do you... Uh, want to make your books like how important is it that the science is uh incredibly grounded in science now and kind of a follow-up to that would be how much research did you do in order to make that happen so maybe we can start on this side and work our way down yes please okay. <laughs> i have no peripheral right now okay, okay. um well 
For example, with as far as how long I researched, I researched for a year and a half before I wrote a single word of my book. My book covers a variety of subjects, starting with lobotomies, but also involving the birth of criminal psychology, the treatment of the insane, especially in the, the Victorian time period, which wasn't pretty. And also the basic idea of lobotomies, which as far as things being technically accurate because of plot, uh, reasons I had to have it set in 1890, and they weren't actually performing lobotomies until 1920, 1930. So that was really problematic for me because I really needed lobotomies, and I really needed 1890. <laughs> and those two things did not did not exist together. However, are any of you familiar with who Phineas Gage is? Phineas Gage, yay! <laughs> Clap for Phineas I Gage. I up there in the back. You actually <laughs> should, because that man was a railroad worker. In 1842, he had a 14-foot-long spike that weighed about 15 pounds, blown through his head. It entered uh, below his eye socket and it came out the top of his, took most of his frontal lobe with it, and he lived. Yes, he lived, and it vastly changed his personality, though, because he basically had a lobotomy from a 14-pound spike. And so I technically, I never used the word lobotomy in the book because they wouldn't have known it, but they did know the purpose of the frontal lobe and they knew that if you messed it up a little bit that it would change your personality because Phineas Gage was a very kind, nice, wonderful man until he had a railroad spike grown through his head. And then he turned into kind of a dick, basically. <laughs> and so they knew that much. And so I, I took those facts and I said, hey, it's fiction and I'm going to run with that because I want lobotomies and I want 1890, so. I do kind of feel, though, if you had a spike through your head, you might become a dick you anyway. Would be grumpy. But <laughs> yeah. I, I think you would be grumpy. Okay. Yeah. Why 1890? Well, originally I had a subplot that involved the World's Fair in Chicago, um, and that actually was hopefully going to be used in a sequel. The sequel hasn't materialized yet, so. But in the end, I learned a lot about Phine Phineas Gage and lobotomies and the World's Fair, and I could actually probably perform a lobotomy myself. I've learned so much mm -hmm. about them, but it's not an exact science. It's very easy. So. <laughs> I'm gonna ask that we do hold off questions till the end, um, and I will annoy you by repeating your question because they asked me to do that. Oh. So, um, but thank you. Um, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you know, for me as a sci-fi thriller writer, you know, the question really becomes how much science to put in and how much to leave out. You know, my first novel I researched for two and a half years and I over-researched it and my first draft, I mean, my wife is kind of my litmus test. You know, I say, read this thing and tell me when it gets boring. And she's like, you know, this passage that's five pages <laughs> on human evolution and <laughs> Neanderthals and, you know, this has got to go. This is way too long. So it's, you know, it's a bit of a struggle. The and I like to think I'm getting better at it, but who knows? You know, Departure is about this plane that you know, takes off in the present and crash lands in the future. This is not totally believable, right? But, you know, as a writer, what we're trying to do is to get the audience to suspend disbelief and to somehow buy into it. And so I think the science is sort of the key to doing that. I mean, you look at novels like The Martian in which the science is just so real and it makes the adventure so vivid. So, you know, the struggle is, well, how much science do I put in to get people to go along and, and kind of believe, and then how much is too much, and when does it get boring? So, you know, every time we get on a plane, um, there's a thing called time dilation, so we actually travel in time, right? But it's, we're talking nanoseconds, so no one really, you can't appreciate it, but if you got up on a spaceship and flew, you know, at relativistic speeds, you know, time would basically stop, right? So, you know, I use that as kind of an aspect in departure to say, well, you know, if they, invented this technology where the plane went really fast for a fraction of a second, these people could, could somehow transport themselves to this other world. But, you know, for me, um, and so there's a lot more science in departure. There's this speculation on what the future might be like in 2147. And it's, you know, I'm such a geek. It, I get so excited about the science and the technology. I can get kind of wrapped up in it. And I have to keep reminding myself, you know, it's about characters and, you know, what's the struggle and what's the story. But, um, yeah, I think it's tough. Great. Yeah, the, you know, you've heard both, both people who've spoken so far have both talked about the need for this balance. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's fiction. And the, the balance that comes in is there are people out there who 
you know, we demand a lot of fact in our fiction these days. Uh, and, you know, John Grisham has sort of become my hero because he wrote a book called The Racketeer a number of years ago. It was a really, it was a great book, really fun book. And I got to the end of it and there's an author's note and he goes, nothing in this book is true. <laughs> he goes, I made it all up. He goes, is there actually a federal penitentiary in this city? I have no idea. Is there actually a law that says this, this, and this? Beats the hell out of me. If there is, it's a coincidence. And he just, and it, I was like, God, I wish I could be you. Because, <laughs> because I was in the middle of writing this, this trilogy about a kid whose father is a serial killer. And I knew that if I did not nail the forensic science perfectly, that people were going to hang me. And because everybody watches Criminal Minds and CSI and they all think they know this stuff, but guess what? You don't. Mm -hmm. It takes longer than a couple of hours to get DNA results. <laughs> it, dri it drove me crazy. So then when I was working on After the Red Rain with Peter, I was like, okay, this is hundreds of years in the future. I can just make up whatever I want. But there's still, you have to have this, this base level of verisimilitude so that people will willingly, as we like to say, suspend their disbelief and go, well, I know that couldn't really happen, but I'll buy it because you're, you're very convincing. And uh, specifically, without getting too much into spoiler territory, there was something that I remembered from high school biology about how uh, chlorophyll, the molecule for chlorophyll, which of course is the basic building block of, of plants, and the molecule of hemoglobin, which of course is the basic building block of blood, they are very, very similar. You swap out some magnesium and they're, they're basically identical molecules. And I was able to build some interesting things based around that fact. Uh, and then obviously everything after that is made up, but the fact that those two molecules are so similar is actual scientific fact and made me think, okay, I'm not totally pulling this out of my ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, as I said, it's a, it's a big fat book. Well, actually, it's not that fat. Um, big fat f uh, family saga set on the moon. And I wanted the science to put constraints on the characters' lives. Um, one of the great rules of sitcom writing is always have your characters trapped in a situation you can't, they can't get out of. It's like friends. All those friends, they're stuck together forever. All of them. <laughs> Frasier, they're all stuck in the same house together. Always have your characters trapped so they always end up in the same place. So I, I, I started to look at the, uh, the, the I was going to say geophysics, but the selenophysics, to be, to be accurate, of, <laughs> of the moon, to see what I could find that, that would trap my characters there. Um, and I discovered that uh, human bone density, at the time I was writing the book, this has changed since writing the book, science always updates itself, uh, that human bone density diminishes in low gravity, and Earth, the moon's gravity is a sixth of the Earth's gravity, and muscle strength deteriorates, uh, body fluids uh, move around the body, organs physically shift position in low gravity. And to an extent where after a certain amount of time, if you return to normal Earth gravity, it will probably kill you. And I looked up, and that's a great way of trapping someone in this situation. <laughs> it's also a ticking clock. So I researched how long it would take this to happen. And at the time I was writing the book, uh, the best knowledge was two years. So if you go to the moon to work, there's a two year ticking clock. And after that, you stay, and if you stay, you stay forever, or you go. And for a writer, that's a great fun mechanism to have because, because first of all, it, the people who stay are trapped there. The kids who are born there can never go back to Earth. They're trapped there. But also, it's a great way of kind of splitting up relationships. You know, if you have lovers, partners, wives, you know, at some point they fall in love, but, you know, will will gravity tear them apart at the end or not? So I found the actual hard science, hard science, you know, the physics of gravity and how human bodies work in low gravity was actually a very rich way of opening up characters and getting into the emotional lives of people whose lives are constrained by it. In my series, because my audience, 10-year-old girls, so they uh, are being exposed to a lot of these scientific concepts for the very first time. And I have to stand back from... Uh, a, an overall thematic stance, which says that science is not something else. Science is something that you do all the time, and it's just 
looking at the world and it's being curious about it and it's kind of futzing with it to see what will happen and that this is the most natural, most human thing in the world. It is not some kind of alien technology in a box that arrives and says, oh, the science is in here. You know, we are sciencing all the damn time. Mm -hmm. So I have um, these two very different characters um, and one of them is very linear and very analytical and the other one is very romantic and imaginative and very intuitive, very good at reading people. Whereas the other one you put somewhere on the uh, on the autism spectrum, and yet they have to work together and and think holistically and uh, and, and use their different character strengths to navigate a, a fairly complex, an increasingly complex world. So all of the science that's in there is certainly credible. Um, you know, there there's some basic physics involved. Now I have Ada in possession of what she calls the Ble which is the Byron Lignotractatic engine. Uh, and it's essentially Babbage's difference engine, um, although she, th this thing was not built in her lifetime, but she's got a much smaller scaled down version in her library closet. Um, and it could actually work. It's a, basically, it's a, a kind of a ratchet work computer and it's capable of doing some fairly simple, um, uh, it's, it's programmable. So this thing could actually work. Um, but mesmerism also uh, appears in the first book, and we know that Ada Byron, later Ada Lovelace, had a lifelong fascination with mesmerism. In fact, she wrote a, a book about it. And this was considered to be legitimate science at the time. They knew that you could magnetize water and use that magnetic water for therapeutic purposes. There, and they had science behind that backed it up at the time until they had more science that failed to back it up and we <laughs> packed that theory away. So um, I'm not only introducing scientific ideas, but I'm uh, introducing a kind of a hermeneutic where um, science is kind of what you've got to work with at the time and something, a better idea will come along and your ideas are disposable and that that's okay. In fact, that's what makes it cool, is the fact that we can only ever know so much before we learn something that completely dismantles whatever we were sure of five minutes ago. Um, and it makes, from a character standpoint, it makes the world a kind of an unsteady and scary space, but it also makes it a very promising space. You don't always know what's going on, and that theme progresses throughout the series and you know, we're talking about book seven now in terms of the map so everything just gets weirder but the same kind of weirdness that you experience if you worked in the lab all the time so one of the things i've been hearing uh from all of you is there's both a i mean and th this is true in any speculative fiction there's that what if moment that is kind of driving like how the story took place, whether it's what if, you know, there were lobotomies in the 1800s. What if uh, there was this rain in this future that was uh, destroying everything or like a plane crashes in the future or whatever. Um, is that, and I'm going to kind of keep this more open now, a little bit looser, but um, is that really like your starting point when you're writing or was it more... Like, so did you start with a, a scientific principle in mind or did you start more with, like, I have this character that I really want to focus on. Um, let's see where I can put them. Let's see what she can do, what he's capable of, et cetera. So I'm just going to kind of throw that out there. and You can dive in. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll or, go in first. It, it, uh, anybody can. I'll yeah. go in first because I have the most ignoble reason for it um, <laughs> in that... Um, Creativity. We, we, a lot of us, a, a, a lot of people, have a Victorian notion of creativity. That writers, creatives, go up to a room, sweat in a garret, and pour with their creative muse to get this brilliant thing that's hovering out there in some shapeless form down onto the page, and they sweat blood. Creativity doesn't actually work like that in reality. It's <laughs> it's bits of random crap that fall together, and. A long time, well, not, not wasn't a long time ago, um, I listened to a podcast called the Cood Street Podcast done by an Australian editor called Jonathan Stratton and Dr. Gary K. Wolfe, who's an academic at the University of, uh, in Chicago. And they talk about science fiction. And they've been talking about 
near future solar, you know, solar system science fiction. And Gary Wolf said, you know, there's lots of books about the new solar system, the new Mars. I'd love to see a new moon story about a new moon base. And I thought, I've always loved moon bases. And I filed that peak in the corner of my mind. And with, with that sound? Did it make that yes, sound it when it went in there? Yes, it does. <laughs> Every time. Y yours doesn't. Um, I, have, I have them muted. No, uh, I find the noise is annoying. No, no, it's like key tones on 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 on, on your phone. It's great. Um, and then um, a, f a, a while back, uh, my wife was watching television, and I said, "What are you watching on the television?" I said, "I'm watching the reboot of Dallas." And I said, "I loved Dallas," and I watched it, and it was crap, <laughs> <laughs> except except for Larry Hagman, who was magnificent, because he always was magnificent. But I remember thinking, and that just got me thinking, hmm, family dramas, isn't that great? You know, um, people love family dramas. It's a thing that hasn't really been done much in science fiction. We tend to go for, you know, the, uh, for either noir or thrillers, but, but, uh, you know, but family dramas have a, play, have a place there. And I kind of thought, and it went pink in another place in my brain, and then, few days later, I was, I, was, uh, I was at the gym in a jacuzzi, and those two bits of went pink went pink together, and there it was, Dallas on the moon, and it's as simple as that. Uh, creativity, it's, it's all the random crap we file away. Some people are just very good at putting those bits of random crap together and making a new thing out of it. Every, everything is a mashup, ultimately. Um, I have a very odd origin story for the seed that started a madness so discreet. I have an addictive personality, and that doesn't mean that people like to be around me all the time. It means that I tend to do one thing for a very long period of time and think it's the best thing that ever happened, and then I'm done. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was really into lobotomies. That was what I was into. I was reading all about lobotomies. I was fascinated by them. And I had read <coughs> the biography of the doctor who was America's first lobotomist. I was reading that. I was reading The Devil in the White City by Eric Larson. I was reading Arthur Conan Doyle, and I was wondering, the real impetus was I was wondering what it would actually feel like to get a lobotomy, because you don't have nerve endings in your brain. Your brain can't feel. So I thought, you know, barring the fact that you're punching through your occipital lobe or your temporal, you know, barring the damage to your face, I was like, you know, you wouldn't actually feel that. And I was sitting there wondering these really odd things that I wonder when I'm alone. And I looked over at my nightstand where I had The Devil in the White City, Arthur Conan Doyle, biography of, an, of a uh, lobotomist. And I was like, oh, if I took all those and I went, <coughs> and I made them one book, that would be awesome. And then I thought, oh, I'm a writer. I can do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in to say that for me, um, it, again, just in terms of the impetus of the project, uh, the idea that science is not this third party entity, that it is something that, that is completely natural and intuitive. And particularly, this is something that we, uh, we have a cultural problem. We have a very significant and urgent cultural problem, which is the fact that we have a lot of challenges on this planet. And if we, restrict ourselves to using half the brains on it, we're not going to catch up in time. And um, particularly in some really exciting fields, we are losing the female brain from participating in a large chunk of this problem solving. And what can I do about that as a, as a bit of a shit disturber and as a parent and as a parent of a, of a young girl? And um, so I was really looking at real world role models, like wh who are the young women who change the world as young women through the power of their curiosity and uh, their intellect. And uh, so in order to do that, I had to use what I call chronobanging, which is actually just an acronym, but chronobanging sounds like it involves a large wrench and it's a little more fun. So I had to kind of smash some certain things together in the timeline in order to make this uh, work as a, as a story, as a series, and to support the the, the character arcs because they're the things that they're tangling with. You know, I, I think it's always about um, finding out what your characters want and not giving it to them, and then after they've suffered for 200 pages, you give them a cookie for being good little characters and putting up with you for being a horrible author. And, and of course, in a series, what you have to do on the first page of the second book is take the cookie away. And you have to make them suffer for another 200 pages. So 
I'm such a jerk, really. Uh, but that, that process of character engagement in science and by making it uh, feel very ambient, feel like this is just a kind of a background radiation to their lives is, um, uh, is, is super important. And I, I get to play with all kinds of aspects. I mean, uh, in book three, we're into cryptography. So uh, I get to poke all over the place in terms of subject matter because the Regency period on the threshold of the Victorian era was such a really, really interesting time because science became very, very mainstream and, uh, and extremely popular. This is a thing you know, people would read scientific journals by the fire in the evening. And, when, um, and particularly for young women, this uh, natural history, go out and draw flowers, but actually draw these flowers in such a way that you can identify them. Um, taxonomy was you know, the, the, the bird watching uh, of its day. You would take this thing and you would actually figure out exactly what kind of species is this. And you'd all sit around this in the parlor and you'd discuss what species of daffodil you've discovered that day. Um, so this was a real thing and it concretized and it made a very immediate experience, particularly for young women, about how they navigated the world around them by kind of breaking it down into its component parts. And it's a really interesting way of looking at the world it's a really interesting way of solving problems, and it's a really interesting way to write characters. Well, to, in a very weird way, the science and research um, actually led me to departure. I was working on a new trilogy, and I'd spent like a year researching this new thing, and I was really burnt out on it. I mean, I was um, spending day after day reading these journals and, and planning out these character arcs and things like that, and I was like, God, you know, I'd love to write something that would just be fun, that I could just start and I could, you know, I think you mentioned earlier, Barry, you could just write and it wouldn't matter. You wouldn't have to research and you could just go and go and go. And I was like, well, you know, how could I do that? Well, what if a plane took off in 2015 and crash land in the future? I can just make up whatever I want, right? And so, you know, I was researching this other series and I was like, oh, God, I'll just write this other thing because it'll be so much fun. And um, I got in a lot of trouble because, you know, departure starts out, you know, the plane crashes and it's all about the characters and survival. And then I got to this point um, to where I had to back up and basically do three or four months of research on, okay, now how do I make this believable? Because, you know, as a, as a writer, we're obviously using the science to make the story believable and to help the reader suspend disbelief. But for me, I was like, oh man, if I got here and I was reading this, I would not buy this. You know, this has to be explained and you've got to sell it to me <coughs> with science, right? So um, so that was cool. And I, was, I spent four months in Europe traveling to some of the places that the book is set in. So that was pretty cool. So, you know, I think it's, you know, science and we also use, you know, real things from settings and, and history I think is just as important. But uh, yeah, for me it was, um, you know, I think there's a balance of science and making the story fun and just wanting to write every day, so. That sounds like fun, I'll just do that, is the deadliest thing an author can think. <laughs> you get you in trouble. It does, because yeah. you think, this will be so, so easy and so much fun, and then the next thing you know, you're on page 5,024, and the book is not over. Yep. Um, but uh, for me, you know, th this was interesting because of all, you know most of my books come about in certain ways, but this is the first time one came, literally came to me, because Peter and and Rob, who is the the other co-author, who was uh, Peter's producing partner at the time, they sort of came up with the general framework, and they came to me and said, "Doesn't this sound cool? You know, let let's let's make a book." And I was like, "Well, guys, this isn't really a story. You've got a couple characters, and you've sort of got this idea for a world, but that's not a story." Maybe maybe it's a movie, but it's not a story. And, uh, ooh. Aunt Barry Laggett just hit, never mind. Um, but, uh, so I, I thought about it a lot, and I, and I was trying to think of ways to make it a little different from sort of other post-apocalyptic stories, because I've heard there are some out there. And... And what I, what I hit on was, and again, it's just this serendipity that, that seems to, you know, that, that Ian talked about. 
you know, I was reading at the time a book called A World Lit Only by Fire by a guy named William Manchester, which is sort of an accounting of how the Dark Ages became the Renaissance. And there's a lot of quibbles with his scholarship, and people always yell at me whenever I bring up this book. It doesn't matter if what he's saying is true or not. What matters is what it, how it clicked for me. One of the things he talks about is how you know, the Dark Ages were so long that, that there was no generational memory mm. of a better time. You know, if you were a poor peasant farmer, your father was a poor peasant farmer. And his father and his father, going all the way back, nobody could remember a time when you weren't a peasant farmer. So there was no point trying to be anything but a peasant farmer because you couldn't even imagine that there was anything else. And the more I thought about that, I thought, oh, this book isn't post-apocalyptic. This is the Dark Ages, but in the future. And that was, that was how the book sort of clicked for me. It's, you know... My editor was like, oh, do they have the internet? And I'm like, well, no. They have something called the Wikinet, which, think about Wiki for a second. It's like the internet, but anybody can edit anything on it. So imagine how useful that is. Not at all. <laughs> and, and, and so all these things just sort of clicked into place as a result. And it was just, it was really, you know, I, it was, I was given pieces from different puzzles that didn't fit together. And then I had to sort of get my chisel and my file and my rasp and make them fit together. And it was... It was a really interesting intellectual exercise, and it was nothing I'd ever had to do before in any book. Cool. And our moderator has transmogrified. <laughs> yeah. right. Alakazam! So this panel does not start at 5.45, like my notes said. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Peter Kleins. I'm moderating, but they were pretty much doing it themselves so far. Um, I'm off the hook. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and now that we're caught up, um, I actually wanted to ask, talk about science, because you've all mentioned this one or another, uh, scientific research that all of us know as authors, research is very easily a black hole that you fall down and, you know, one minute you're just looking to see, you know, how many joints in a cockroach leg and three days later you're, you know, discovering a really fantastic thing about tribolites. Um, at what point, like, did you, especially, okay, when in some cases, like you were saying, we've, we're making up science. You know, how far do you go with research generally? Do you do a, just a draft and not worry about it? Do you try and figure out some stuff ahead of time? Do you? Well, I think it's really easy to over research. I know in my case, like I said, I, I really do, I am pretty confident I could perform a lobotomy. And like I said, it's not, it's not, it, if There'll it, be a demonstration even, later. Even if it went wrong, you know, I'm if it went wrong, it wouldn't really matter. So I want to see this. I know. I see. I'm really proud of this, I, but it doesn't really require a lot of cool. skill. Let's is go. the thing. Um, but you know, I I learned so much about lobotomies. I I read thousands of pages about lobotomies, and also trepanning, uh, which, if you're familiar, is where you punch a hole in the skull so that the brain can swell. I'm game, by the way. Like we can do this. Oh, we can trepan. Like, yeah. People do that there's still. There's like now, they use drills. There's YouTube. A, there's a penguin yeah. party after, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. It opens your third eye. Yes, well. absolutely. <laughs> it's amazing. People use it all the time. Odysseus knew all about it. But yeah, it was it was totally it was a thing that people would punch holes in their skulls <laughs> if they were swelling, so their brains could come out like a mushroom and sit on their head and then go back in and you wouldn't die because your blood was, was uh, locked up. Your brain was had its circulation cut off. So I read surgeon's notes from the Civil War about how to trep in. I went to a Revolutionary War reenactment and talked to the guy that was pretending to be a Revolutionary War doctor and asked him to show me how to trep in. And he did it on a melon and the woman next to me passed out. <laughs> And I was videotaping, and I thought it was, it was the greatest thing ever. So I did all of this. I learned all about trepanning, all about lobotomies. And then I was writing the book, and I got to the scenes where this was going to be the most critical point for me to know this information. And I wrote my scene, and I was like, that's done. And it was two paragraphs. It was two paragraphs. And let me tell you, you could use it. Don't, but you could use it for a step-by-step -step on doing a lobotomy. But I had researched, I had put a year and a half of my life into learning so much, and I wrote two paragraphs. So you can, you can really overstep. I know so much about lobotomies, though. It's amazing. <laughs> you keep, you, you, you keep I'm very this. proud. <laughs> I'm very proud. I have to use it now. I mean, that's the thing. I wrote my two paras, and I'm like, well, now what? All of her books will now have lobotomies. Yeah, they will. <laughs> I'm actually writing a book titled Lobotomy. 
<laughs> because I'm like, I have to use this now. I'm not actually. I'm, I'm going to try to get away with that in my next kid's book. A lobotomy. Yeah. Kids, I, go for it. My editor's in the room, so I'm just going to look for her reaction. <laughs> Um, when, you're, when you write a research-heavy book, you throw away 80% of your research. Mm -hmm. You never use it. But unless you do the research, you won't know which 80% you don't need <laughs> to use in the first place. Um, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, it, is, it, it, it is a wonderfully fun black hole you can fall into, um, especially because writers love prevaricating. Writers will do anything rather than write. Writers usually have the cleanest houses, the neatest gardens. Um, I'm quite sure that the Great Wall of China was probably built by writers. <laughs> <laughs> and research is because because you feel you you need just this little bit more to have that little extra angle you need the whole thing. And of course you don't. Um, I mean, I have I have I have lovely appendices. I've, uh, I discovered that the Hawaiians have a lunar calendar. They have a 31-day calendar with a different name for each day of the month, and that's perfect for a society set on the moon. And there's a big list of the entire Hawaiian calendar at the back of the book. It's there, should you need it. <laughs> I only ever mention the actual Hawaiian day of the week twice in the entire book, <laughs> but it's there because I liked it. <laughs> and I couldn't bear not to use it. You have your darlings, you, you, you kind of have the bits of research that you really, really want to do. Um, this isn't referring to this book um, at all. A uh, previous adult book I wrote was called The Dervish House, set in Istanbul in the near future. And I discovered a thing called a mellified man. And what a mellified man is, it, uh, it, I'll, I'll keep this short, it's a, it's a good long story. In medieval Arabia, when ancient Islamic gentlemen grew tired of life, they would decide to do something noble. And what they would do is they would eat honey. They'd eat nothing but honey three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, nothing but honey, until they sweated honey, until their urine was honey, until they excreted honey, and they would die of massive sugar poisoning. And then they would bury the body in a stone coffin, top it up with honey. I've, I've got you guys in the palm of my hand there. <laughs> top, top and he's making all of this up. No, top, <laughs> it, <laughs> top it up with honey and then seal the top of the dead coffin. They put a date on it, and that's the decant date, two or three hundred years in the future, or even. Three. And at that date, you would take the lid off the coffin. What you had inside was a human, basically, a hu yeah, a human jelly. Basically, it was, it was it was a human body preserved in honey. And this was a very powerful cure for all manner of ills and diseases. The the, the jinn were afraid of the power of a mellified man. It would, if you rubbed it on a body, it would. It would take away wounds and heal, heal, heal breaks. If you ate it, it was even more powerful. And I read this and thought, I'm putting that in the book. I don't care. I don't <laughs> care what I have to do. I am putting this in my book. And I did. And people love it. And, but to show my dedication to my research for that, I actually got a leg of lamb. And I got a very large Kilner jar. And I have a leg of lamb. It's been in honey for about seven or eight years now. <laughs> so I may leave it a little bit longer just to see what comes out of it. Uh, um, so, so exactly, it, it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like the trepanning and the lobotomy. There are, there, are so, there are bits you come across that you love so much, you will do anything to get them into your book. Yeah, I, I kind of ran into um, the basics where I've got uh, a, a character who's the world's first computer programmer. So how do you actually start from uh, a mechanical phenomena of something that going tick, or in the case of uh, a zero in a binary language, like something not going tick. And how can you use, take something as abstract as an event, or the weather, or mood, or physical evidence gathers, scene, or an observation, and translate that from its very initial instance into a tick or a non-tick, and what does that look like? And so I ended up having, uh, you know, creating all these different models for what is the, what would be the most primitive computer that you could actually build, and I created the system where I've got spindles with holes in them, and you can either fill the hole with something, and then it turns and it ratchets, and either it sets off a counter, and the thing is either counted or not, but then all you're really doing is looking at something that can count more than one thing at a time. And then you have to extrapolate patterns from that. Uh, and the software for extrapolating that patterns doesn't actually exist 
for well past uh, even when we get well into a, a, a electronic computing and well past that. So you know, we could count data for a long time before we actually knew what the hell we were looking at. And so then to scale that back into something that can, can click with the, the mind of a very bright and inquisitive 11 year old girl, um, it was definitely pushing the bounds. So at some point I just have to kind of back off and say, computer science exists, just bear with me. It's a thing. It really, it really is a thing, and it's possible, and so it does become. There's a degree of, of MacGuffining that I think you, you have to introduce in fiction. Otherwise, it's like, okay, kids, well, let's sit around the campfire. We're all gonna do comp sci 101, and six months later, they all walk around and they're like, they're 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 applying for jobs at Microsoft, but they haven't finished your novel yet, <laughs> and um, uh, you, you're not really doing the reader any favors at that point. So sometimes you just have to kind of go and say. Trust me, this sounds sounds very convincing at the time. That's actually a great point. When do when do all of you find that point where okay, these things we need to have hard science. We need to have numbers. We need to have math. We need things that we can back up. And then the soft science stuff where it's like just trust me, this works. We're we're going to reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. It'll be fine. <laughs> it'll <laughs> and it'll solve everything. <laughs> Since neutrons are neutral by definition, I don't know how you can reverse the polarity. The, the but anyway, <laughs> I, I mean, it's I, technical. I, it's very technical. <laughs> Insert babble here. Um, I, I've always felt like you sort of, it, 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 it's sort of like tricking children into getting into your van. Um, <laughs> you wanna, I was never on this panel. You want to <laughs> give them enough candy to get them closer, and then once they're in, that's when you slam the door, and then you don't have to worry about the candy anymore. And, um, but I mean, you, that, that sort of, you know, you, you want to treat the reader that way. You might all be deposed for this sometime in the future. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wrote serial killer books. I, you, know, um, you really want to... <laughs> You really want to, uh, you, you, you want to, you, you're, you're seducing the reader. You're telling the reader, look at this. And the reader goes, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then you're telling the reader, look at this. And they're going, that makes sense. And look at this. That makes sense. And you've backed all that stuff up. And then you go, now look at this. And they go, well, that, yeah, okay. All those other things made sense. So I guess this makes sense, too. And it's when, when do you, it, it's how you make that transition, how you make that transition over. Um, and, and. I mean, honestly, people hate when I say this, but it really it's one of those things where when you're writing, it becomes a gut feeling, I think. Yeah. I don't think that there's a, a matrix or a schedule or, or, or a graph or anything like that that shows you, okay, after four paragraphs of, of actual scientific information, the reader is mentally prepared you know, for, for this or is primed for this. You just go with your gut. And for me, it usually becomes when I'm tired of going from my notes to the keyboard. You know, it's like, okay, I'm tired of looking this shit up. I'm just going to go with it now, and hopefully it'll work. Yeah, I think, the, yeah, the first draft is always kind of instincts, and there is this kind of propensity to put all the research in there because you did the work, and, you know, you, you love the research. It. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I know what I'm talking about here. you got to trust me. But the, um, the other thing is you get tons of emails from readers. So over time you collect so much data, and you kind of know where – people stop believing on certain things. So for me, I mean, I'm a pretty young writer, and when I wrote my first novel, I mean, I spent two and a half years researching this thing, and I knew I wasn't, that the story and the research was better than my writing, so I leaned more, you know, that novel was a techno thriller, it was much more science heavy, because I was like, God, you know, even if they don't like the characters of the story, I mean, the science here is great, I mean, it's uh, really <laughs> interesting, so they may as well read it, but, um, yeah, I think, you know, this is my fourth novel, so, you know, when I was writing it, it was really, what story do I want to tell, and now what science do I need to have readers believe that story? And um, so definitely my research process has changed a bit, but um, it's still, I mean, you know, I got a lot of emails from readers on departure, and I kind of, I learned a lot more. It's like, oh, well, I stopped believing here, or I believe the whole thing, or love the whole thing. So I think you learn with every novel. We never get it right. I think yeah. that there is a fear um, and, a, and a valid point. When you are creating science that can make so much sense that it actually removes mystery from the equation and it removes um, the 
that it, it just shatters that suspension of disbelief. I call it the midichlorian problem. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, um, I wouldn't use the analogy quite of enticing children into my van. <laughs> but, um, what are you hiding? <laughs> Why are you afraid of using that metaphor? An innocent man would not be afraid of it. <laughs> My way of thinking of it is more like um, passing a foreign coin off in your loose change. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the thank you. There you go. <laughs> Elegant, concise, and accurate. <laughs> and, um, in that, for it to you know, for, you know, for it to go into the machine, <coughs> it has to be of a similar size to a true coin. It has to be of a similar weight to a true coin, but it doesn't have to be a true coin. In other words, it has to be sciency enough to be passable. Um, it has to fit with the rest of what you're passing off as real science to be to not kind of stick out like a sore thumb. So, so choose your analogies. <laughs> Pedophile, small change, speech. <laughs> <you know? laughs> choose um, wisely. I didn't say anything about pedophilia. <laughs> no, he just said you he was giving candy to children. To the, yeah, 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 you have no that. idea. Transportation. <laughs> this was I'm a interested. I'm story. interested that that's right where you went. That's very interesting. <laughs> He's a school bus driver. It's fine. Um, when I was writing In a Handful of Deaths, which is the second in my post-apocalyptic survival duology there, was a moment when uh, we out, my characters ended up way out west, and I was dealing with people who do not have enough water to drink, and everyone is always saying that your, the human body is 80% water. And I get very tired of cannibalism being touted as like, this is the worst thing you can do. Eating people is really bad. And you know, when the first time I came across, it is, but, you know, it's like the first time I came across cannibalism when I was like 12, and I don't mean like I tried it, I mean, <laughs> I mean like I read it, salt, whatever. And I was like, wow, that's terrible. And I'm past, you know, I'm past, the shock factor's gone. I'm like, yes, we understand cannibals. And I was tired of that. So I'm like, okay, so what if you're not eating people, but you're drinking them? Yeah, I know. I'm like, how do you get, okay, so there's 80% of your body is water. How, how do we get that out? And so I did some Googling, <laughs> and I had a, so no one should ever look, I really was paranoid. I'm like, no one should ever work at the, look at the history on my computer, because they're going to be like, yeah. wow. <laughs> but you know, usually you do a Google search, and you have four or five pages to scroll through. You have to sort out your information. I Googled, how do you get water out of the human body? It's like, Google was like, I don't know. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, man. Okay, so you, it's in there. You can get it out. I'm going to play with that. So I have some, a friend that is a surgeon, and I came up with a method. And I said, Lydia, would this work? She emailed me back, and she said, um, yeah, technically that would work. And I was like, awesome. Thanks, man. <laughs> and so people, whenever, when I do things, people that have read the second book, they say, Mindy, I have to ask you. Where did you come up with this thing in the book with, you know, when that happens? And I said, Oh, I made that up. And I came out of my head. And they're like, Oh, okay. <laughs> it's way worse. It's like worse than when you start talking about vans. Yeah. They're very, they're scared. It's weird. So, but would it actually work? I don't know. Um, I, I hope I'm never in a situation where I have to find out. But yeah, I supposedly. According to you know the technicals, yes, it would. We can do that after the lobotomy. Yeah, I've got all. Of, I have the lists. patients are very cooperative at that point. Yeah, I have like a check mark, like I have a list yeah, with check no. mark boxes. So I mean, if you look under your seats, you'll find a number. <laughs> <laughs> Let me. Um, we're probably gonna. We got a little time left to take questions. I got one, one more question for you to flip it around. No one has to name anything, but. Why do you think it is, everyone here has a really great science-based book, set in the past, set in the future. Um, you've got other books, like uh, the one that pops to mind is The Martian by Andy Weir, which, I mean, the guy has six pages on how to grow potatoes, you know, and here's another four pages on how we make water. Why is it that some writers get away with this, that we can have all our scientific stuff, and other writers have three paragraphs of exposition and they lose you? Right there. What do you, what do you think is the mis or a mistake being made? I think in the case of the Martian, it comes down to voice. I really do. I mean, Mark Watley's voice. Right. I mean, the opening line of that book. I'm pretty much fucked. Mm -hmm. Right. Right from the opening line of that book, he's got you with an interesting character and a and a great voice. 
And so, yeah, when he's, you know, describing the quite dry and boring process of growing potatoes in Martian soil, which I mean dry and boring in terms of the actual steps taken, not the fact that, holy crap, this guy just grew potatoes on Mars. Um, <laughs> when he's doing that, you're, you're along for the ride because it's Mark Watley, and Mark Watley's fun, and he's thinking about Aquaman, and, you know, and, and it's interesting. And I think, I, I really think that's what it comes down to for the most part. Yeah, I think a really good writer can write about anything and hold your interest. Uh, Devil in the White City by Eric Larson is about America's first serial, serial killer, but it's also about the Chicago World's Fair, and there's a huge amount of that book dedicated to the different plants that were grown for the Chicago World's Fair. How they built the Ferris wheel. How they built the Ferris <laughs> wheel. Uh, it's talking about how it's really hard to build tall buildings in Chicago because of the silt. And, and you're just like, oh. And you, you learn a lot, and you're fascinated. And you go and you tell people, you're like, I just read this great book about silt. And they're just like, oh. But oh, Devil in the White City is amazing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No one else? Anyone have any questions for our distinguished panel? It's slightly different in writing uh, because every detail has to be a telling detail. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's like those terrible, boring thrillers that, that, that go on about the size of pistols and all that and the particular make. It's just kind of detail for detail's sake. I think in the kind of stuff we do, every detail has to earn its place and tell you either something about the character it's related to, the story as it involves, or the world in which those characters are, are, are related. Um, in this one, uh, people 3D print their clothes. Mm. You, you, well, you finish the clothes the day, you throw them in the hopper, deprint them, you print something out the next day. If you can print clothes there, you can print any, any style you want. So I got thinking, well, in most science fiction people, in most, sci most sci-fi, the clothes suck. They're really sucky. And I thought, well, if you can print your own clothes, why not have it from the one of the more elegant decades, the 1950s? So the women's dresses are all like, so all the women look like, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, look like Grace Kelly in this book. And the men have impeccable suits with, um, you know, with, with, with pocket, pocket squares. squares. Yeah, because <laughs> you can print your own clothes. So why not make something that looks good rather than something that looks sucky? That tells you something about the way, you know, what the character's values are, you know, the, their personal style and, what the, and how the world works, all in one kind of fairly small, simple detail, 1950s fashion. So that detail earns its place, tells you about the world, tells you about the characters, all in one small package. And, it, and it's also a great detail because you, you're just building off a technology we all know. Yeah. We understand imme immediately what 3D printing is, even if you're using it in a whole new way we've never seen yeah. before. Yeah. So, uh, There was actually right there, I think. Story and makes it irrelevant. So how far have we got? And how did you find 
I, I would throw in um, your Chekhov has this wonderful bit, but that if there's a, a a gun in the first scene, the gun has to go off before the end of the play. That's the Russian play, right? Not the Star Trek character. <laughs> <laughs> if, if there's the a phaser right in the first scene. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, when I crafted this book, I actually crafted this the series, and so I have all these guns lying around I have that, that, that don't go off in the first book. You know, everybody walks past this umbrella stand or whatever it is, and, and uh, then you get these little notes from editing. It's like, nothing happens as an umbrella stand, and you've mentioned it three times. I just, just wait. <laughs> I have a plan for it. And it's so, you know, at the end of the second book or the end of the third book meeting, it's like, but there, can we get rid of that umbrella stand you mentioned? It's like, just wait. So I don't write back, I just write forward. So it's like, okay, I just need a bigger idea to encompass the thing. If I go down a, some kind of rabbit hole, um, I'll find a rabbit at the end of it. You know, you, that, that's a, if you paint yourself into a corner, then you just need a sledgehammer or some kind of, you know, dynamite ex machina. You, that's, um, that's, that's part of it. I, I'm not a fan of, of unwriting or going back. It's just like, just, just grab them and go. Didn't say it had to be coherent. <laughs> <laughs> also, you know that's that's why there are editors. That's right. Honestly, you, know, you can sometimes you just like okay, well I'm just balls out and I'm gonna go down off this crazy direction. And you know sometimes you can get away with it. You can actually surprise yourself by the time that you get to chapter 15. You go, this actually all kind of lined up really well. It's like I planned it all out. And your editor says, no, that didn't. That what are you talking about? Um, and you know the global find replace, and 30 seconds later the problem is solved. So um, I, it, that's not so much part of the writing process as rewriting. I think you know there's writing is rewriting. Of course we all know this, but um, I, yeah, I don't don't. I would I, as advice as much as any writer can ever give another writer advice because you know, you're the one who has to live with the book in your head. Um, just go forward. Don't go backwards. Just go forward. Uh, guy in the back. I, I normally, I'm lying through the whole book. I mean, none of this ever happened personally. So if I have to lie m more about one thing, it doesn't really change it for me. Um, honestly, if I've done it right, you shouldn't be able to spot the lie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I tend to think of it as, as like as like skating over thin ice. You know, if if you know there's thin ice under your plot or your science, if you go fast enough, you'll get over it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of yeah, take it at speed and and yeah and and and, ju and just have a bit of chutzpah about it really. It's, uh, well, and at the end of the day, we are we well, obviously we want to put as much research as possible. We are writing fiction. We are writing stories about things that never happen to people that don't exist. So if we have to lie a little bit, I mean, yes, definitely. You just go for it and and just push past that. And recognize that there's always going to be at least one reader who knows more about the topic than you mm -hmm. and is very happy to tell you what a screw up you are. <laughs> and realize, seriously, it doesn't matter. That book's just not for that person. Like, you know, we all have areas that we know very well. And if you re read a novel set in that area, in that milieu, and you read it, and you found something that just was completely false and just didn't work for you and pulled you out of the book and killed the book for you, that book's just not for you, you know? We all have the right to read books that we enjoy. We don't have the right to have every book be one that we enjoy. Mm -hmm. So put down the book and go read something that's not gonna make you pull your hair out. Um, you're gonna get readers like that, and oh well. There, there's nothing you can do about it, it un unless you're just gonna write a very dry recitation of fact. Even then, somebody will complain about it. <laughs> I've only had one complaint ab uh, about, f about factual errors in my book. A book. It was an old fantasy book I wrote years ago in the 1990s. 
and it was um, the, and it was a typewritten letter, and it was to do with tractors, <laughs> of all things. And I mentioned a, a particular brand of Massey Ferguson tractor in the year 1931. And I got started saying, I think you'll find that this version of the Massey Ferguson was not available until 1933, which was... <laughs> <laughs> Only one. Clearly, your book takes place in an alternate universe <laughs> where that tractor was available two years early. Uh, how how much candy do you have to offer the kids to get into your tractor <laughs> <laughs> before you lobotomize them? In the back, over there. Just about anything. I mean, everyone is a resource for something. And pretty much you have a conversation with someone and you're going to learn something new. And you find people or things, books, reenactments, anything near you. Uh, obviously, Google brings everything nearer to us. But the internet is very important. But again, I always double check anything that I find on the internet. I'm also a librarian. so. I'm never going to just be like, oh, Wikipedia said, so it's cool. <laughs> so, you know, I double check everything and I, I have to have things definitely be as accurate as possible, but there are resources everywhere. Um, I can't, it, just having a conversation with someone can spring an entire novel. Everything is a resource, I, I feel. I write for 11 year old girls, they all have superpowers. And if you sit down and you ask, 20 random questions from an 11 year old girl, I guarantee she will blow your minds off so far there will be skull fragments on the ceiling. Mm -hmm. They are just amazing little humans and they look at the world in this incredible way that will just completely upset any kind of uh, operating set you entered the conversation with. For this book, just one tool, Google Moon, amazing. <laughs> Uh, I think we have time for one last question, if it's a quick question, right in the front. Um, I was wondering, if you have a lot of details in your book, and a lot of action scenes, and a lot of really important things, how do you incorporate those things into the book? Like, how do you make it so that you don't put them all in one or two pages, and then have the rest of the book be like, oh, we have like a right this? Because I try to write, and I come up with all these good ideas, and then they take up like a page, and then I wonder, okay, I have 40 pages, how am I going to write the rest, and then I have nowhere else to go? You might not be a novelist. You might be a short story writer or a novella writer or a screenplay writer. There's nothing wrong with any of that. Uh, you know, it's not just how do I make it longer. It's, it, you know, you said what if you have a lot of important scenes. Every scene should be important. It, you don't break up the book and go, well, today I'm going to write an important scene. Tomorrow I'll write some of the ones that really don't matter. They all matter. And if you have enough of them to fill 40 pages, your story is 40 pages long. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't beat yourself up. Don't go, but it's supposed to be 300 pages. No, it's supposed to be exactly as long as it's supposed to be. It's like my high school Spanish teacher used to say when we would say, how long do our essays have to be? She would say, make it like a skirt, long enough to cover the topic, but short enough to be interesting. <laughs> and on that note... <laughs>